Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, going to resume this example. Sexual work in an atelier in Kyoto for several decades, and then move of that uh, drawing is anyone eat some there at the back with a life of an artist monk in a larger urban monastery. New monastic context was supported by samurai. There must have been few encumbrances by the Uchi family. Okay, so while you while you're looking at that SIS system and transcribe art at Chon no, the stereo. Uh, I will review what what happened in this process. Recall that said we've got a tank, a CSTR, and we've got the all the requirements to add an SIS system. An SIS system, you'll recall, is a system that gets triggered by community project. And here in this case, we said we don't want an unsafe exothermic reaction to run away. So we've got this very high temperature developing in the CSTR. Like what we will do is we'll measure that temperature. We use one thermocouple, a second or a third, to really get an accurate hold on that temperature. In the temperature reading to trigger the SIS. So we'll typically put some logic in the SIS system to ensure when you analyze sessions for a few seconds before triggering SIS. So uh, that avoids um, momentarily um, having a glitch in your system from triggering SIS. And when that SIS signal is received by um, the temperature, when the field exceeds the critical limits, the SIS system will trigger. So basically the logic in the computer would say, if T is greater than T critical, well the first thing you do is um, you allow the operators that you're going Notice how Seshu depicted the trees and rocks um, or with firm and dark brush. That SIS will be triggered. Now this is, this is far in fairly uh, quadrant. For long and see how all that outline stops short of the this is control painting. That is not able to eliminate the clouds. Seems that Seshu wants to change the Alarmed with the operator to tell the operators that that temperature is unsafe, and the operators either have ignored the alarm, operators are not able to get that temperature in control, and so now we resort to an automated system, which will try to bring the process to a condition of safe to connect to the Zen or a shutdown essentially. Okay, so. What do and other thing in the industry these days is painting of safe parking. The process you move the process to some interest from burning pine twigs and adding resin that acted as a binder and helped form an ink stick. To produce ink, the stick is move the process to a point of so it's an exothermic reaction. The first thing you need to do, uh, or not the first, go through it in order of the valves. One of the things you'd want to do is to hot water. Trig a signal from the SIS. Remember that three-way solenoid valve water. drive and fly. Solenoid valve you until the artist achieves the rest of the hot water. I the landscape the that the grid ink okay. only used during startup to get the tank up to temperature. Regardless of the fact, whether hot water is off and typically should be off during no normal operation, we will still put in a second Good of in surface support, but even if as part of his design of the composition. We don't, we're not going to in use as any sort, sort of guarantee we close the second valve in the line to really ensure that there's no heat coming into that system. We don't want to add more heat into a tank that's already over the temperature requirement. Our cooling water we want to fully open Okay. Now, there's a control valve in the line from the cooling water pump into the, into the jacket. And we cannot rely on the position of that valve. The regular control system would have already tried to open this valve 100%. But what we're going to do is we're going to add a bypass around it, fully open that valve, and put that into it. So 
it might be that that valve is already open during this unsafe point in the tank's operation, but regardless of that, we will still bypass it. Everyone clear? It work. It must bypass. It's not going to necessarily provide us extra cooling water. It just simply says, I don't care what's happening to that valve. I The third valve up here is related. Oh, okay. Action. So we don't want to provide any more material to initiate further reaction. So we close that path in the valve uh, line. And then lastly, we would like to put cold solvent into the system. Um, this is a, a new two narrow bands of silk that hang on either side of the center oh, image. By and you can see those bands go here and feeding it bands to the reaction. By open. Oh. We're okay. flushing out it with just an inert solvent. Okay, so that will remove the reactant as well that might have been in there leading to the exothermic reaction. So all four of those positions um, it might in the sequence. So the sequence then will be, a lot, let the operators know that you're triggering this SIS system. Uh, then you'll send a signal to, the, uh, to the, each one of these individual valves. Okay. Would have been hard. Steps two, three, four, and five uh, that send the signals to, the, to those SIS valves. Okay. So I haven't labeled them. I don't... Um, um, have call them, but essentially I'm referring to these. The room was created to be sent the appropriate signal to either and fit open or fully closed. So what you, what you, what I hope you see from this complex of SIS is that it's fairly drastic. Right? We're we're not um, we're beyond the point of taking regular control action from our our basic loops. We're beyond the point of alarm working. Our operators popping it fixed and so we're going to take it fairly drastic action. It's only one step away from the fourth layer which we're going to be considering today which is relief. Relief says get the stuff out by whatever means get it out. Because Once it's gone so this is just one step away from that fairly it is registered. Um, fourth layer. This is a, a failed closed valve, FC, so it's, yeah, it's going to shut the hot water completely. Remember, these valves are going to go to their failure mode because we're essentially going to send a signal that um, removes the regular stress there that go goes pan, keep it open. We're going to cut that signal and the valve is hot water for tea. We're using the failure mechanism are beyond the to um, implement our SKS. So if that's not clear now, to you, review it is largely by elite individuals of the colonoid valve work. Awesome. Look at that just very uh, in depth in this particular example. Right? So essentially what we're doing when SIS is triggered, that, that pressure, that 15 PSIG that we normally send, we cut that, and what we now send to the valve is atmospheric, and so in other words, the valve will fail into its natural position, um, fair closed. We're using a mechanical Small. process that um, doesn't rely on us sending a signal to the valve to close. We're going to let the valve fail close. Okay, so where we're headed to next is, as I, as I mentioned, we're going to now consider this idea of relief. Now, relief is really a last resort. Right? We've gone through a layer here that's automatic. Okay, Here we've gone through a layer that's manual with the operators um, trying to fix the process. Here we've gone through a layer that's automatic. So this is an instrumented system that will automatically try to bring the process to a safe operation point. Now we're, we're okay. really at, at the last resort. This is the last thing we're going to try. And as I said in an earlier class, um, you actually see this in practice. Many companies use their relief system in a bit of a lazy way. But your relief system, really, you shouldn't ever see it being used. 
ideally, the, I, the way that a relief system is designed, the intention of a relief system is that it actually isn't going to be used. And when it is used, it should be investigated as a significant um, safety issue. Okay? Remember that phrase that Trevor Kletz used in the BP video, the idea between a near miss and an accident is a very, very it's fine a line. Right? It's, it's just a little bit of difference in the scenario that would have pushed your near miss to be an accident. I mean, you can consider the use of relief to be a near miss. It's not something that's normally can be used. Okay. So the, the principle of the relief is the following. Tools that we use in with pace have a safety rating. So let me um, go back perhaps to this diagram we looked at the CSTR. That's a closed vessel that purchased. On the side of the vessel, you will always see a factory operating pressure as well as the maximum operating pressure. And then you'll see some other instrument, uh, information like the volume, the weight perhaps, the material of construction. But there's always a nameplate that's welded onto the vessel and it's not something that you can detach permanently. There. The maximum operating pressure tells you that would be factor of that vessel built it. They tested it even to that pressure and they were guaranteeing that the, ve the vessel as long as it's used in the way that it should be used, will not rupture at that pressure. So you can operate the vessel safely at that pressure. You shouldn't normally be operating at the maximum, but it will withstand. And beyond that, you need to provide some form of relief. So as drawn here, this CSTR, if it's pressurized, of space. does not have the relief system required. In your project, you'll also be going back to your PNID and investigating units that need relief. So any time we have a closed system, we must provide relief. Now you look at this, oh, Kevin, that isn't a closed system. There's a valve over there. There's a valve up here. There's some valves up here. That stuff can move in and out. Right? But the so that that is a closed tank. Okay, so that valve could be fully shut, these inlet valves could be fully shut, and now you do have a closed system. So it's not just that it shouldn't be a closed system, it, it can be a closed system. Now, when you, and then you might say, well, I could always put a sign up here and tell the operators, don't close this valve. Okay, right, so if you walk past the city of Hamilton, right now, the east end of the City Hall parking lot, you'll see this lovely valve on the gas line. Do not cut off emergency generator, okay? Now you know that that's not going to be nature, right? Or some idiot walking by and shutting it down. Or if that sign is removed and then someone comes and shuts the valve down, okay? So you will see this. I, I, I'll guarantee you, in your career, you will walk past valves that have signs like this. Do not turn off, do not turn on. Harmony, respect. The incident in the United States was caused by exactly one of these incidents occurring. A sign on the valve saying, do not shut off. Right? So that's the space. Stop a valve from actually being shut or from having a system that normally is open and can be depressurized from being pressurized. So we must provide relief, okay? Uh, Dr. Marlin, this, this does not count as relief. A hand valve or a control valve, even a control valve Take will fail open. That does Sarah. not qualify as a relief device. The principal guess I was device is one of two or three types of mechanical devices that is added onto the vessel that will always provide a path out for the material, okay? And these relief valves look Something like this. This is a safety relief valve. I'll pass this flyer around. It's fit. But the, this equipment hasn't changed very much. And so what you will see there on, that, on those drawings are several um, components. But essentially, the, the bare, the bare um, basic idea is the following. That that base of the valve is what's tied into the tank or into the vessel. So A over here extends up and to the vessel. Discussion way. Okay, so 
next we have then this screw or ability to adjust the tension in the spring and that dynamic artist adjusts the tension to zero. Someone pushing their dates to the Momoyama period. Some accounts you say that to that like Chinese desired pressure on the vegetable. Okay. So we are certain that Jews once immigrated to a conceptual way of, of visual the people on something of a niche is when you go meaning twilight place or the face plate on the vessel you'll see your girl let's call that a hundred percent that's the max pressure okay so let's call this the max and, you know, typically at about ninety percent is but rather by a man who led tea ceremonies and who was struck by the glaze on this bowl, which he thought evoked a landscape. So operate at about 90% of the mix. Yogore is among the At most, you, you probably less, but that would be where you would normally operate beyond that 90%. 16th century. So I recommend you tighten that screw on the on the screen no. so that that vessel so is valve will open up at that particular pressure value. So it's at the point that the pressure should be the potter's wheel. The pressure in the tank should With interact the with blades fired at a low temperature. As material leaves, the pressure in the vessel Look. is obviously not covered in glaze. Or is we get to some point over here where the valve will we use this term reseat itself. The valve will come back down and reset like it with that of to that particular opening. Quite grand. So this beautiful which that valve is open is called your blowdown range. It's just nestled in your hands as you took part in the for that particular relief valve. Feeling a bit too heavy? Okay. And one one is inset on the salon and is the handle there which is used for so you can periodically go and should a tea bowl is attributed to Chojiro and also the tie-in tea room. Valve and then out. Remember to imagine the green matcha tea with okay. And so what we'll see there is that Perfect. and how the texture of the glazed clay would feel cupped in your hands. The experience of attending a tea ceremony engages all the senses. When we talk about we also have to consider containment and extra in time. Sorry. Sorry. Something that can contain what's being relieved. Even if this is Yes, I can open the vessel and charge. I'm uh, sorry to contain it. Okay. So that final layer is designed with have certain material relieving to one container and other relieving to a different container. I'm doing can close there. So if you're dealing with a large refinery, you'll have Understand. vessels to accept various relief gases or liquids. So this pipe, this discharge port can often have several of kilometers of piping um, to get to the final containment site. Okay, so that's one type of relief. The second type of relief is a lot costly. Um, these are called rupture discs and like a prior valve I'll show you they need electricity to operate. That's not our requirement. This uh, burst disc um, is a hemispheric device. There you can see one. It's uh, um, the end of the on it. So these small lines are grooved into that hemispherical disc end, and they will open up once that pressure is achieved. And you buy these, right? And when you buy them, it comes with this attachment that shows you the pressure rating for that diaphragm. Okay, so when you, you put it in line, that piece, that, uh, that label, that part that sticks out, protrudes outside the pipe so you can always see it and you always know what's inside your pipe. So remember, once this is built, you can't see inside, but you 
see that enjoy that what the pressure rate of the is and it will also tell you the direction so you can always go check that it was installed in the correct direction into the ab of the front of the glade um, to make sure okay and today this rough is when that pressure is exceeded beyond the safe level that and it take right in the Edo period began. But now you've got a permanent opening in your in your pressure vessel. In this period, the relief valve over here. Once the pressure inside your tank is back to its safe operating point, that valve will. So why do we have uh, these two types? We'll look at their different quantities in a minute. Just one final point to bear in mind is that when you look at relief valve, the conventional valve, this valve is, is lift last of the three periods. It starts to today. It was to the region over here, and path B is several kilometers towards the containment uh, vessel. There'll be piping, there'll be elbows and bends. And so you can get a significant back pressure building up along B enough to counteract the pressure in A. Okay, so what we'll see then is what's about China or Korea. You've got this sort of accordion China. shape over there to partition the valve. And so when this lifts, you need pressure inside well, it to go somewhere so there's an atmospheric vent. This will lift, but this prevents the back pressure from, from reaching the significant thing for you. He's an artist. So there's about um, two types of design for the relief valve. Okay. Now, why do we have these two types, two very different technologies, one, design, one with a burst diaphragm? Well, if you look at the relief valve, it's, it's a very simple design, it's very low cost. Um, and the valve closes back again. That's, that's the important part. It recloses and you can keep operating your process. You do it. That's why I say, sometimes you see relief valves are abused in that way because a company will set that relief valve pressure and they will use it almost like a process control to, take to regulate the pressure inside the tank. Right? And that's really not the right way of dealing with it. Um, one, the, there's a reason for it, right? Because when you're relieving, that valve is coming back down again. You're relieving, you're, you're coming back down. And if you do that enough time, that valve doesn't always reseat itself. Okay, so it won't necessarily come back exactly to the right location. And you leave gaps in between, leading to constant leaks from your reactor. Now, if that's okay with you, that's fine. But the the typical reason you have to ask yourself why are you relieving is to get rid of a dangerous pressure buildup and to get rid of that material. What can often happen is you can start to accumulate that material in the seat. Okay? So if you're thinking of fluids or um, any sort of polymers, they start to build up a layer inside that valve and at that same location so that eventually you, you'll sum up your valve this whole time and you can be looking around it. Okay. Furthermore, just from a purely economic point of view, you're wasting product. Right? And for companies that operate at very hairline, so I just, that material that you're discharging could be essentially your profits that you're throwing away. In this period, Japanese people were not permitted to travel outside the country and few foreigners were allowed to enter. So I had said, said several times already in this course that there's that two week maintenance period, one week maintenance period in your plant. And one of the other things that happens, not only are you defouled, you're getting Pan still lives presentation technicians in and they're going through every single valve and instrument and recalibrating it. And it's the visual art relief valves. So they check that the pressure so it was among the correct rate the that there isn't corrosion. That is it's really, really critical. On which he corrosion can entirely eliminate the value that a safety uh, valve provides. Right? And so they're, they're checking in for all these issues and then uh, making sure that the safety rating is still correct.
Team Nethercliff Pine Uplands. These islands and I. So two um, two types of valves. Beautiful Disadvantages of the relief valve. Let's take a look at the diaphragm valve. Here, the advantage is that you don't get any leakage un until it's burst, right? Whereas with the valve cross, if that valve has not reseated itself correctly. The other really nice advantage of this is once this thing ruptures, it, it flares out and it opens the entire... Sotatsu may have been recreating the scenery of the place. Although some have argued he depicted a literary relief of your, of your material at a very high capacity, at large volumes, uh, this would be your desired mechanism of doing so. Tatsu, and later presented the set to a Buddhist temple. He had you can get corrosion on that metal surface. Way... This is a valve that will fail in a safe way. So corrosion actually leads to a desire. In fact, they were meant to be seen side by side. The screen on top is... And the other thing is that it really works well there because that is a, it essentially closes your vessel up and it can be deep when you feel this material. Um, it's really, really, that's the desired place for using this valve. Whereas the release valve over here, you've got this. At the top of the composition. And closing, or even if it's open and closed here. And connects with a large rock formation that is capped with Can the left screen. Long, the that valve actually never up. opens again. And even there's even case where appear to be gold clouds, but the one at the top also looks like an island where the pine trees are growing. Japan during the Edo period. Okay. So you wouldn't want to use this type of technology in but that material. Or folding things like this one. It was also quite useful. And also, well, of course, one of the best advantages once this has burst, you, you're essentially, you've shut down your process. Right? You've depressurized your vessel, but you can't go back online and operate again until you've replaced that valve. And that rupture disc is the reason why I don't have one to show you. Is the company will lend me a screen. With lattice work covered by several layers of paper. On top of that, an artist like Sotatsu pasted on a silk for high quality. Um, and they come in very specific sizes for, for the piping that they're. That and gold leaf. Sotatsu presented all of the forms from nature. The the other disadvantage of them is because it's, it's based on a scoring line over there. You both screen pressure and very verified that that pressure um, is accurate. So you get a bit of... Okay, so a bit of them, if you're looking at adding the, your diaphragms, this is uh, the, the standard symbol for the relief valve, looks as follows. For a rupture disc, it will look as shown over there. And then, as we see like them. Sometimes used it. So Tatsu uses... Um, you've got your part. And he you'll sometimes see it look like that. In this work. Sometimes... He just meters. He's enclosed in a box like that, so that's... 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 Okay, so here's a question then. Um, discuss this one. This is closed, right? You don't, you don't see through our pipes. Yet. How do you know when it's burst? Or even if that's a rupture disc, how, the question is only six surviving sets of screens. A related question on the conventional valve, how do you know this valve is leaking? Such locking. Think about that. Discuss it with some. Figure that out. Drop for meeting.
And so it could be integrated into everyday life in a variety of different contexts. to inspire those who looked at them. The screen served to remind the students of an actual geographic location, perhaps one that they wish to, but not. Perhaps the abstract depiction of natural forms certainly might have inspired them. Add some kind of instrumentation, okay, so... Class, I'm but so I'm uh, That's good to redo, because this is when you're on me anyway. Um, you could have For the last few minutes, I invite you to explore the closer look of it at the waves at Matsushima work near my art lab. Be sure to take a look at the screen. Low might be a bit. Yeah. Right, you should have really hard. You should have no pressure otherwise. Okay. You probably would because flow This is not the last few minutes of place it with the with floor the symbol over it. At the wave. Even that might be a very small Be sure to take the regular flow sensor. So a flow sensor is calibrated for a certain lower and upper bound. So it may not actually even pick up a flow. Temperature could well be picked up. So even a slow leak, you'd register a higher temperature than it should be otherwise. And pressure would be certainly um, desirable. So in fact, we today can put that instrumentation. You see a little bit of it over there. There's a, 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 a port and some, some cabling. And the Wen and Ming Dynasty. Okay. I'll see you next class. are actually being ruptured. Now, the next interesting thing, I'll, I'll go through some examples here. Well, let's do the examples, yeah. Um, if we look at that flash vessel um, that we've considered up to now, this is obvious ca uh, case for relief because someone can go close the valve V4 at the entrance and you can have hot material flowing in leading to a pressure buildup. And so on the, on the line leaving the vessel or directly to the vessel itself. Okay? Now typically you won't put this relief valve right into the vessel. Um, when you've bought the vessel from the supplier, it's a, a, a single unit with several pipes lead, leading out. And so you could put this relief valve either on the pipe leaving or on one of the other port, ports on that vessel. But it's got to be in the direct path. Obviously no valves between this and the relief valve. And then you send that off to containment in a suitable way. Um, let's just actually, at this point, I've got, I just wanted to make sure you, there's a little bit of a subtlety here that, that occurs in practice that maybe is not quite as apparent as it should be here. Um, let's just go look back at this video here. Over the next few minutes, the hot feed entering the tower caused the liquid inside start to boil and swell. Liquid filled the tower completely and began spilling into the overhead vapor line, exerting great pressure on the emergency relief valves 150 feet below. Okay. Why are there three of them? Higher throughput. Higher throughput. Any other? If one of them fails. Okay. The, the, when you see these, it's typically one is set at, at an earlier pressure, a medium pressure, and one is at a higher pressure. So it's so, sort of like a staged based um, way of relieving, right? So if it's, a, if it's just above the safe operating point, what, the first one will go. And then if the pressure still keeps rising, then the second one will kick in, and then the third one. So yeah, it does provide a higher throughput. And in this particular safety video, all three of them um, got triggered instantly. 
But you would often see the first one go, then the second one, then the third one, um, as you go to more and more aggressive pressure. So you'll, that's, a, that's a more realistic example in some instances. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure you, you do see, see that. Um, so you could, you could have something conceivably like that here on, maybe not on the flash vessel, but on a unit um, like the one at BP Texas City, the Raffinet Tower. Here's another, I don't know why that zoomed past. Um, let's take a look. This is an interesting example. A positive displacement pump. Uh, we, we've heard about these from our prior courses, and the mechanism through which they work is kind of like a pump, a piston in a motor vehicle where that moves up and down and, and pulls material through. Here's another example of a positive displacement pump, which is a gear pump. Uh, companies use this when they want to dose a very careful amount of flow to the downstream unit because you know for every gear rotation you're guaranteed a certain volume of flow. Right? So in fact you can even measure how much flow you've got there by the number of rotations of the gears. It's, there's a mathematical relationship there. Or you could use a lobe pump. Now either way what you're seeing is that once you've got material flowing through a positive displacement pump you have to have some way for it to pass out. Okay. You can't go shut that valve. If an operator does go close that valve, that pump will break in a very, very short time, a couple of seconds. Sorry, not the valve will, will break. The pump will break in a, in a few seconds, right? Because you've got an incompressible fluid being forced here. You're going to build up a pressure in that little piece of pipe very rapidly, leading to failure. And the, probably the first thing that's going to fail is the pump, not the pipe. So the shaft might break off from the pump, leading to pieces flying around. And so a typical way that we will improve the safety of the system is not by adding a pressure controller, right? You might think to add a pressure controller here to then turn the pump off or turn the, open the valve up, but a pressure controller probably won't react fast enough. Um, and certainly it's not something you want to rely on to do it. So what we can do is use this um, relief valve that we've just learned about. It's an entirely mechanical system and it will relieve and we can discharge back into the tank, right? So instead of wasting the material, we can simply recycle it and discharge back into the tank itself. So there's a use of a relief valve in a way um, that's actually beneficial to us. Okay, now again, that valve should never be closed, so we, ne we really should never use that relief system um, to do that job for us. But we do want to make this process safer. Another example is in a heat exchanger. A typical application of relief here on a heat exchanger, we've seen this bypass now several times where you've got your, your material, your cold material coming in and will enter the heat exchanger on the shell side. And on the tube side, we're, we're sending hot fluid through and so we should have a hot stream leaving here at B3. Okay, and so we've seen that over and over. Now, there's one valve that can be shut that can cause a problem. If the operator comes by and mistakenly shuts down V3, what bad thing is going to happen next? It doesn't matter what the status of the other valves are. If V3 is shut, We're going to build up pressure on the shell side of the heat exchanger because we're still sending hot fluid in there. We're either going to start to boil and build the pressure up inside the vessel and we've basically created a pressure tank Okay, if V3 is shut. Even if V4 is open, there's still going to be material trapped in that line from earlier. Right? It doesn't matter what the status of the other valves are. The only valve that matters here is V3 and if someone goes and shuts that by mistake, which can happen, you will get this unsafe problem developing. And in the safety video we saw earlier is that Trevor Kletz explicitly mentioned an operator changing a position of a valve should not have a catastrophic failure. We need to try and make our processes intrinsically safe to do that, uh, to get that right. So V3 is your critical valve here from a safety perspective and we must have relief then on that heat exchanger to avoid that from happening. Okay, so there's, there's several cases here. The heat exchanger, the positive displacement pump, 
the pressure vessel in the flash uh, drum example where we've seen relief. And then a final example I, I'd like you to consider. This one is an interesting one. Here we have two relief valves in series. So here's my vessel operating at very high pressure potentially. I have a burst diaphragm and then I have a safety relief valve after that. Consider some cases based on what we've just discussed in this class earlier. Consider some cases where this is actually a useful system. What, is, what advantages is this setup providing to us? So take a few a minutes and discuss that with someone. Why would we spend all this extra money on really expensive safety equipment? Okay, any suggestions, Joseph? Uh, I just wanted to ask if we can put a manual valve before the diaphragm uh, thing so that it, when it's closed, instead of turning off the process, like if it blows and the pressure goes out, right, and then yeah. you're, you're okay, instead of turning off your process, you can close the valve and replace it. Okay, so the, the question being asked is can I go put a manual valve over here before my burst diaphragm valve so that if the burst diaphragm valve is has blown, I can go quickly change it out without having to shut down my process. Yeah, if, if the pressure goes in then, right? Obviously, I'm not saying we should close it as well, but I'm just trying to... Okay. Any concerns with that? Yeah. Yeah. You're potentially basically cutting off your entire safety system. And it would be exactly the same as the brainless case of the Hamilton City Hall that has that sign there, do not close valve, right? You know that someone's going to go close it at some point and forget to open it, right? So you'd, you'd never, the whole idea of this system is that this is your last resort. You don't want to turn it off. This is your safety net before that unit blows, right? And you don't want any possible mistake to cause that safety net to disappear, okay? So, no, we would never put a manual valve here. As tempting as it is to close the process down to isolate it so you can quickly go replace the rupture valve, rupture disc. Okay, so back to the original question. Any thoughts on why we have two in series? Does it make it more safe? What aspect? You see this on drawings regularly. Why would you see this? Uh, just, maybe just to give you a bit more context, this is not some hypothetical situation. This is... Um, there's an actual example of it here from AICHE publishes the safety beacon alerts and there's your rupture disc, there's your safety relief valve, there's your intermediate pressure gauge. Okay? We see this regularly on processes. You will see this on PNIDs. Uh, they're talking about the hazards of this, but there is some benefit, right? It's not that it's a pure hazard. It does provide benefit in some cases. What, what situations? Strong, Sean. Uh, maybe I have a, you'd have the rupture disc go at a lower pressure than the safety valve afterwards, and you put the indicator in the middle, so if it does go, you have 
takes going to leave some pressure depending on how much pipe you have there. Okay. And then it at least can give someone an idea that for system when can we do something else that maybe wastes a bit less than that pressure taking valve actually supporting the balloon. Okay. So it probably wouldn't take a lot of time to move the pipe. No, it would, yeah, it would certainly be pretty quick. These are like such a short period that it's not providing any significant relief. Okay, so no, it's not, it's not being used here as an early warning system. Um, that's what your SIS and alarm should be doing for you already. Yeah, Joseph? Uh, I, I would say that they go at the same time, but then if your pressure goes back down, the relief valve will go back. It, you'll see it, so again, so okay. that you're not wasting material for the whole time you're putting it in the boat. Right, so that's, that's definitely an aspect, is that once the both go at the same time, or shortly back to back, that um, that, that pressure relief, the safety relief valve, does actually shut your process down to bring it back to a point where you're not wasting valuable material. But essentially the purpose of this, this uh, diaphragm valve there is to protect the safety valve. It's, it's a barrier that protects the safety valve for the case where you are processing material that is sticky and uh, potentially could gum up the safety relief valve. Remember we said that idea that the, the valve needs to come back down and reseat itself so you don't want a buildup of sticky polymeric type material at that valve seat. And so we will put this as a sacrificial element there to take out, but it protects the valve downstream of it. Because it prevents that sticky material from building up on the valve seat over there. Remember the rupture, the burst diaphragm doesn't care. It will always fail when the pressure is exceeded. So, so that's the reason why we do it um, in series. The next um, other important point is that we should always protect for vacuum as well. Um, in vessels, there's a, a number of stories. This book here, again, I'll mention Trevor Kletz's name, uh, What Went Wrong. It's a very easy readable example of hundreds of case studies, like a paragraph each of exactly what went wrong divided up into different categories. And one of the sections in the book talks about vessels being sucked in. Right? So it's easy to relieve pressure. Vessels are made to withstand pressure, but they're not made to withstand vacuum so readily. And so here's an example of a valve, a valve that will relieve for pressure. This pin here will break um, or move out the way when high pressure is exceeded, but it will also have another mechanism here to bring outside air in to um, to compensate for vacuum being built up. And of course, this is sized the appropriate width so that you can get air in fast enough. Now, if you think that this will never occur to you, just even think of this example. You have a storage tank on a hot summer's day, the sun beating down on it, and an hour or two later, you have a thunderstorm come by, and the rain cools that tank down suddenly. Right? So you've got this drastic change in temperature the pressure in that tank suddenly drops and needs to be relieved. Right? Countless of tanks have crumpled in on their own selves because they haven't had this very simple mechanism to bring um, compensating air in. Okay, so this will happen without your operators doing anything. Just nature will do this for you um, if you're not taking care of it. Another example, um, this is one that I saw working in pharmaceutical industry. We, we work with propellants. So like, think like shaving cream or any sort of medication that comes in an injectable canister. And when you're creating that product, you're working in a building that must handle explosions. Those of you that are going to tour Xerox for 4W, you'll see this. Uh, Marco Saban will point out to you the walls in the plant are made to f explode and fall out. Right? So if an explosion occurs in there, you don't want the bricks and the roof go flying out. You would you let the wall, sacrifice the wall, and have vents so that it opens up. And you don't go put your parking lot over there or your, the little stand for the smokers to go stand at, right? So you put a barrier there so no people are in that neighborhood um, so that when that event does occur, you don't injure people, okay? So we, that's relief. We don't cover containment too much other than to mention that we'll typically flare, we'll burn this material, okay? So I'll mention that a little bit in class on Friday. On Wednesday's class, remember, we have the guest speaker from Praxair. 